The closer something is to resembling humans, but never quite getting there, the scarier it seems to be. When voices and silhouettes are almost familiar and feel nearly alluring, you may be very close to a nightmarish demise. Welcome back to Unexplained Encounters. I'm your host, Darkness Prevails, and I think you should check out my card game at cryptidcardgame.com, cause believe me, it's fun. Today's episode is all about those things in the dark that are really good, but not perfect, at mimicking people. Enjoy. Send me your scary stories at darkstories.org. Now, let's begin. The Mimic From Macy This happened not too long ago at my dad's house in Charleston. It was about a month back, I think. I was in my room and couldn't sleep, so I just decided to watch TV. I've always had a weird feeling about my room at my dad's place. You see, we have this small room behind a bookshelf that opened like a door. I've lived in that house since I was seven. I've never been scared of it before, even as a little kid. But for some reason, my room has been freaking me out as of late. The creaking of the ceiling fan, the faint noise of the air vent that barely works, it all seems a little bit unnerving. As I was watching TV, I heard something coming from the bookshelf door, this faint tapping noise. I rewound the show I was watching to see if it was part of the program, but I didn't hear the tapping this time. Once I turned off the TV, I heard the tapping again. I just assumed it was my dog, who sometimes wakes up in the middle of the night. Now, I'm not going to say the tapping didn't scare me. It definitely did. I tried to go to sleep, but the tapping started once more. It was louder than the first time. Scarlet, I know that's you, I yelled, thinking it was my little sister. The tapping then stopped, and I then heard a voice at the door that sounded like my little sister. Macy, please, can I sleep in your room tonight? I can't sleep, the voice said. But... I knew it wasn't my sister. My sister would not have started talking to me outside of my door like that voice did. The voice sounded like my sister, but something about it also sounded inhuman. I didn't reply to it. I didn't say anything. I didn't know exactly what to think of it. All I knew was that that was not my sister. I then heard slow stomping as the thing at my door began to walk away. I locked my door and kept my lights on. I don't exactly know how I went to sleep after that, but I did. The night after, my dad and my little sister went to the store. I was home alone. I was on the phone with my friend as I was scared that that thing would show up again. After about an hour, she had to go so I said goodbye and hung up reluctantly. I went downstairs to watch a movie with my dog. I didn't feel so creeped out. After all, my dog is a 150-pound Great Dane. Halfway through our movie, I heard a knocking at the front door. Hello? I got locked out of my house. Can you please help me? It sounded like my neighbor. I walked over to the door and was about to open it when a thought popped into my head. That's not my neighbor. She should be out of town. I quickly backed away from the door, grabbed a knife from the kitchen in case whatever was outside, tried to get in. The knocking got faster and louder. Tears welled up in my eyes. I was so afraid. After a while, the knocking stopped, and the thing outside walked away. My dog was cowering in a corner instead of barking. Eventually, my dad and my sister came home, and we all went to bed. After that night, I've not heard the thing again. I'm still scared of my room to this day, but as long as I have my lamp on, I'm okay. I will never forget those experiences. 
The Voices in Piney Grove From Chris I've never shared this story before, not even with my closest friends. I'm a 32-year-old guy living in rural Virginia. I've always been an outdoorsy type, spending most of my free time hiking, camping, and hunting in the Blue Ridge Mountains. I am not the kind of person who scares easily, and I've had my fair share of close calls with wildlife. But nothing could have prepared me for what I encountered last October. It was the first weekend of deer hunting season. I had decided to try out a new spot, deep in the Piney Grove Preserve. This area is known for its dense pine forests and rugged terrain, perfect for big bucks, but also notoriously easy to get lost in. I'd spent weeks scouting the area, setting up trail cams, marking my route with GPS. I was confident I knew the lay of the land. I set out before dawn on Saturday morning, my truck loaded with gear for an overnight stay. The plan was to hike about five miles in, set up camp, then spend the evening and early morning hunting from a tree stand, which I had already set up earlier in the week. Everything went smoothly at first. The weather was perfect, crisp and cool with a light breeze. I made it to my campsite by early afternoon, and I got everything set up. As dusk approached, I made my way to the tree stand. It was positioned on the edge of a small clearing, giving me a good view of a well-used game trail. I settled in for the long wait, my rifle ready across my lap. The forest grew quiet as night fell, with only the occasional hoot of an owl or rustle of leaves breaking the silence. It must have been around 9pm when I first heard it. A faint sound carried on the wind like someone calling out in the distance. At first, I dismissed it as something insignificant, maybe just some animal noise distorted by the terrain. But then I heard it again, clearer this time. Hello? Is anyone out there? The voice sounded human, female, and distressed. My first instinct was concern. Had some hiker gotten lost out here? That wasn't unheard of, especially in this area. I hesitated, unsure whether to call back or stay quiet. Before I could decide, the voice came again, a bit closer than before. Please, can someone help me? I'm lost. It was coming from the opposite direction of the game trail, deeper in the woods. I turned in my stand straining my eyes to see through the darkness. The nearly full moon provided some light, but the dense canopy cast deep shadows everywhere. I couldn't see anyone, but the voice sounded like it was only a couple hundred yards away now. Hello? I finally called out. You okay? Do you need help? Silence fell for a long moment. Then, from much closer, maybe only 50 yards away, I heard a response that made my blood run cold. Chris? Is that you, Chris? It was my mother's voice, exactly like her voice, down to the slight southern drawl she'd never quite shaken. But that was impossible. My mother lived three states away and had never been to this part of Virginia in her life. Plus, she was terrified of the woods and would never be out here alone at night. I felt the hairs on the back of my neck stand up. Something was very, very wrong here. I clicked on my headlamp, sweeping its beam across the trees, but saw nothing. Who's out there? I called trying to keep my voice steady. This isn't funny. A rustle came from the underbrush to my left, like something big moving through the bushes. Then another voice spoke, this one deeper, unmistakably male. Son, what are you doing up there? Come on down, it's time to go home. My father's voice, but my dad had passed away five years ago. 
I felt a cold sweat break out all over my body. This could not be happening. I had to be dreaming. Maybe I had fallen asleep in the stand. Maybe I was having some kind of hyper-realistic nightmare. I pinched myself hard, willing myself to wake up, but nothing changed. The rustling sound grew louder, circling around the base of my tree. I swung my rifle down, training it on the movement, my finger hovering near the trigger. Stay back, I shouted, my voice cracking with terror. I will shoot. A low chuckle emanated from directly below me, a sound that was almost but not quite human. It was followed by a rapid series of clicks and pops, like something trying to mimic speech but not getting it right. Then, in a voice that was an unsettling blend of my parents' tones, Come, Chris. We've been waiting for you. It's time to join us. I saw something move at the base of the tree. A pale shape that seemed to shift and writhe in ways that defied human anatomy. In the dim moonlight, I caught a glimpse of what looked like elongated limbs and a face that was horrifically blank, like a mannequin's. Pure primal terror gripped me. Without thinking, I fired my rifle. The shot rang out deafeningly in the quiet forest, and I heard a piercing shriek that was definitely not human. The shape at the base of the tree darted away with inhuman speed, disappearing into the underbrush. For a moment, Everything was silent. Suddenly, the woods erupted with noise. Dozens of voices, some I recognized, some I didn't. All calling my name from every direction, they were pleading, angry, seductive, a cacophony of human speech that seemed to press in on me at all sides. I don't remember climbing down the tree stand. My next clear memory was of running full tilt through the woods, my headlamp bouncing wildly as I crashed through the undergrowth and leapt over fallen logs. I had no idea if I was going in the right direction. All I knew was that I had to get away from those voices. Branches whipped at my face, and I stumbled more than once, but pure adrenaline kept me going. The voices followed, always seeming to be right behind me, or just off to the sides. Sometimes they sounded like they were coming from right next to my ear, making me flinch and change direction. I don't know how long I ran. It felt like hours, but realistically, it was likely only 30 minutes. Eventually, I burst out of the tree line and onto a gravel road. By some miracle, it was only about half a mile from where I had parked my truck. I sprinted down that road faster than I'd ever run in my life, not daring to look back. When I reached my truck, I fumbled with the keys, my hands shaking so badly I could barely get the door unlocked. As I climbed in and slammed the door, I heard a final voice, this one sounding like a child. Don't leave us, Chris. We'll be waiting for you to come back. I peeled out of there, gravel flying as I accelerated down the forest road. I didn't slow down until I hit the highway, and I didn't stop driving until I was back in my own driveway. The sun was just starting to peek over the horizon. I've tried to rationalize what happened that night. Maybe some kind of hallucination brought on by contaminated water or gas from my camp stove. Maybe I did doze off in that tree stand and I had the most vivid night terror. But no matter what excuse I drum up, I know it was real. I left all my gear out there. My tent, my sleeping bag. I even dropped my hunting rifle out there. Nothing could make me go back to retrieve it. I haven't set foot in those woods since that night. You could not pay me enough money to ever go back. If you're ever out in the Virginia backwoods and you start to hear your family's voice when they shouldn't be there, you should have been running 10 minutes ago. Willow Creek Whisperer 
from Gregory Horror Show Fan. I've been holding on to this story for some time, and to be honest, I'm still not sure about sharing it. But after listening to this podcast, it all came flooding back, and I feel like I need to get it off my chest. Maybe that will help me make sense of what happened all those years ago in Willow Creek. As a quick note, this town isn't actually called Willow Creek, but for the sake of privacy and anonymity, I'm going to call it that. For context, I grew up in a small town in northern Michigan, right on the edge of a vast stretch of wilderness. Willow Creek wasn't much more than a collection of houses, a general store, and a small elementary school back then, surrounded by dense forests and winding streams. It was the kind of place where everyone knew everyone else, and kids had free reign to explore the woods as long as we were home by dinner. I was 10 years old when it all started, in the summer of 1995. My best friend back then was a girl named Sarah, who lived just down the road from me. We spent most of our days building forts in the woods, catching frogs in the creek, making up elaborate fantasy worlds. It was a scorching hot day in July when we decided to venture further into the woods than we'd ever gone before. We packed up some sandwiches and juice boxes, feeling like real explorers as we set off down an overgrown trail which led away from the creek. We must have walked for a couple of hours, the forest growing denser and darker. I remember feeling a bit uneasy, like we'd crossed some invisible boundary into a place that we were not supposed to be. I assumed it was the feeling a child gets when they travel too far. But Sarah was fearless, always pushing us to go just a little bit further. We were about to turn back when we stumbled upon something. An old, large, gnarled willow tree. Its branches drooped so low, they almost touched the ground. There was something off about it, though I couldn't put my finger on what exactly. The air felt heavier there, and it was eerily quiet. No birds singing, no insects buzzing. Sarah, always the brave one, walked right up to the tree and ducked under its curtain of leaves. I hesitated, a strange sense of dread creeping over me. Come on, Alex, Sarah called from inside the tree. It's so cool in here. I took a deep breath and followed her in. The space under the willow was dim and cool, a welcome relief from the summer heat. Sarah was right. It was pretty magical in there, like we had discovered our own secret hideout. We were about to start planning all the adventures we'd have in our new fort when we heard it. A soft, whispering voice coming from somewhere above us. Come. We froze, looking at each other with wide eyes. The voice didn't sound like anyone we knew, and it had a strange echoing quality to it. Did you hear that? Sarah whispered. I nodded, heart pounding. Might have been the wind, I suggested, not believing it myself. The voice came once more, louder than the first time. I'm lonely. Climb up here keep me company. Sarah, curious, started to look up into the branches. Do you see anyone? She asked. I scanned the tangle of branches and leaves above us, but I saw nothing. We should go, I said, tugging on Sarah's arm. This is creepy. For once, Sarah didn't argue. We ducked back out from under the willow and started to speed walk back the way we'd came. As we left the clearing, I swear I heard a faint, disappointed sigh rustling through the leaves behind us. We didn't talk much on the way home. Both of us were trying to process what happened. By the time we got back to our neighborhood, we'd halfway convinced ourselves we'd imagined the whole thing. But that was just the beginning. Over the next few weeks, we heard more stories from other kids in town. Jenny Parker swore she'd heard someone calling her name when she was picking berries near the edge of the woods, but when she looked around, no one was there. The Thompson twins said they saw a strange shadowy figure darting between trees 
when they were camping in the backyard. Each story was a little different, but they all had one thing in common. A voice that sounded almost, but not quite, human. Adults dismissed it as kids' overactive imaginations, of course, but we knew better. We started to call the thing the Whisperer, this thing that lurked in the woods and tried to lure kids away. It became our local boogeyman, the story we'd whisper to each other at sleepovers to see who would get scared first. I didn't have another encounter with it that summer, but Sarah did. She showed up at my house one evening, pale and shaking. She said she'd been walking home from the library when she heard someone calling her from the woods. It sounded like her mom at first, telling her to come quick, that there had been an accident. Sarah began to run towards the voice when she realized her mom was working late that night and could not possibly be in the woods. It wasn't her voice anymore when I stopped. Sarah told me. Her eyes grew wide with fear. It got all distorted and angry. It said, it said it would get me next time. I wanted to believe Sarah was just trying to mess with me, but I had never seen her so scared before. We made a pact that day to never go back in the woods alone. As summer turned to fall, the encounters seemed to die down. We started to relax a little, thinking maybe whatever it was had moved on. But then, in early October, everything changed. It was a crisp Saturday morning, and the news spread through town like wildfire. Billy Hutchins, a seven-year-old who lived on the outskirts of Willow Creek, had vanished from his backyard the night before. Search parties were being organized, and soon the whole town was combing the woods, calling Billy's name. I remember the pit in my stomach as I overheard the adults talking. Billy had told his mom he was going to play in his treehouse for a while before dinner. She called him in to eat about an hour later, but he didn't respond. When she went to check on him, the treehouse was empty, and there was no sign of Billy anywhere. The search went on for days. Police dogs, helicopters, volunteers from neighboring towns, it seemed like the whole world had descended on our little corner of Michigan. But they never found a trace of Billy. It was like he'd simply vanished into thin air. In the wake of Billy's disappearance, parents cracked down hard. No more playing in the woods, no more staying out after dark. The carefree days of our childhood seemed to end overnight. But here's the thing that still haunts me to this very day. The night Billy disappeared, I was sleeping over at Sarah's house. We were up late watching movies in her living room when we both heard it. A voice just outside the window, one that we recognized. I'm going with him. It's so fun. You guys should come too said Billy. We looked at each other in horror. Billy was not the type to walk alone at night, and we knew exactly who he was referring to. The Whisperer. We huddled together on the couch until morning, too terrified to even think about sleep. We never told anyone what we heard that night. Who would believe us? And more importantly, what could anyone have done? That thing in the woods, whatever it was, it had won. It had finally taken a child. The strange encounter stopped after that. No more voices calling from the trees, no more shadowy figures glimpsed at the edge of the forest. We could only guess the whisperer had been satisfied and had moved on. Years passed and life in Willow Creek slowly returned to normal. Billy Hutchins became a cautionary tale, his story told to remind kids not to wander off alone. Most of the adults chalked it up to a tragic accident or a wild animal attack. Those of us who had encountered the Whisperer knew better, but we rarely spoke of it, even amongst ourselves. I left Willow Creek for college and never moved back. Though I do visit my parents from time to time, 
Sarah stayed, taking over her family's hardware store. We don't talk much anymore. Too many painful memories, I guess. Different lives to live. Sometimes when I'm lying awake at night, I still hear that voice in my head, Billy's voice, telling me that we should come too. I can't help but wonder, what if we had told someone? Could we have saved Billy? Could we have rallied the adults and torn Billy from that thing's clutches? Or would we have been the ones to disappear next? I don't have any answers, even after all these years. If you're ever out in the woods alone, and you hear someone calling your name, someone who sounds almost, but not quite, like someone you know, do not answer. Don't follow. Just run. My First Skinwalker Encounter From Harlow My family believes we're being stalked, hunted, haunted, and teased by one or more skinwalkers. This has been going on for years, on and off. We live on a farm, and these entities are making more frequent appearances than ever as of late. My kids are scared, as they've seen it several times, as have my husband and I. We even believe it's been indoors from time to time with us. The glimpses I've seen at first appeared to have been that of a naked man, moving with extreme speed, faster than I can keep an eye on. It peeks around corners of the house at my kids and makes human and animal cries at night. It's terrifying. We found doors unlocked, left open at night, and when we investigate, we catch a glimpse of it. Garage doors, too. Doors that no one ever opens, mind you. There's no good explanation for it. Living on a farm, we are used to the sounds of coyotes howling, barking, and different animals of prey screaming when attacked. The screams we've been hearing lately are not the same sounds of coyote attacks. These are screams that sound human. They're blood-curdling cries. I've never heard anything like it before. I don't know if there is something that can be done to keep them at bay. I believe many of these evil entities come in and out of our dimension, but I would love to keep them out, if that's possible. Here is one of the more terrifying encounters. It was August 14th. A meteor shower was going on until the 24th. I was curious to see it, so I went out late at a certain time. It was exactly 1 a.m. I was outside in front of my house, standing in the middle of the road, staring up at the clear night sky. I was watching some comets pass by all by myself. Just to note, in front of my house across the road is a good five acres of unclaimed desert land. I'm from Arizona, where Navajo skinwalkers seem to originate from. As I was standing there, I began to hear these odd noises. I want to say they're like a branch cracking or crunching, something like that. This noise came directly from in front of me, about 100 yards away. At the time, I didn't think much of it. It's important to note that after this whole experience, I did my research, and everything seemed to add up to my story. There are reasons I believe it was a skinwalker. It was far away, but I've read accounts where people mention that the farther away the sounds of a skinwalker might seem, the closer it actually is. I'm only mentioning this because not even 10 seconds later, I heard a very strange noise coming from the left side of the front of my house. This was close, about 50 feet away. I was already spooked. Living in Arizona for six years, these noises were unfamiliar and different. I was always out at night, and I could tell when it was just a desert rabbit or a couple of coyotes. As these strange noises occurred, the worst feeling I've ever felt in my 17 years came over me. It was very weird. It made me feel very uneasy. It was that gut feeling like I knew something bad was going to happen soon, or was already happening. That sense of impending doom. Then, as fast as the noises started, they stopped. But this was a short pause. 
I heard faint talking coming from the same spot where the noises had happened not long after. It sounded like a little girl. I couldn't make out a single word, as it was quiet, faint, and practically gibberish. But it was definitely feminine. I know that much. Then it stopped again, and immediately after, clear as day, twice as loud as the talking before, I heard my name. Noah! In that very moment, I don't think I've ever been more truly terrified. I was super freaked out. I began to walk towards my front door. A quick note, I read that skinwalkers tend to mimic the voices of people and sound very human-like to try to lure people in. I also read that in most cases with kids, skinwalkers will purposefully lurk around or near houses, and everything unfolded just outside of mine. My heart was racing at that moment, and that gut feeling I got was still there, just as bad, if not worse. I was at the bottom of my driveway now, already turned around, heading for the front door of my home. As bad and freaky as things already were, you'd figure things couldn't get any worse. That was until, on the right side of me, I heard the gravel of our front yard crunching. It was deep and long, two crunches. It was coming towards me now, no more than 20 feet away. Unfortunately, I hadn't seen anything with my own eyes. It was too dark, and the steps had occurred on the opposite side of my sister's car to the right of me, so I didn't have a clear line of sight as I walked up the driveway. At this moment, I was scared out of my literal mind. When I heard the crunch of the gravel, I was on the verge of calling out or even yelling at whatever thing was coming my way. But I didn't. I refrained from doing so. My gut instincts told me that initiating something like that would most likely make things far worse. I tried my best to keep my composure. The entire inside of me was collectively screaming as a whole at the time. I was at the top of the driveway now. My driveway is slanted. I was no more than maybe five feet from the door when, on both sides of me, these sounds or steps picked up faster, coming towards me. Fortunately for me, I didn't acknowledge the things that happened at the time, or at least I tried my best to ignore it for my own safety, and I didn't initiate anything with whatever was truly out there. I made it to the door and locked it up quickly behind me. But things just got freakier from there. Whatever had just happened had scared me out of my mind. You know how when you have a bad feeling, it tends to go away after the so-called bad thing happens? Well, that feeling hadn't gone away, and I was still on high alert. I put the cover over our large dog door. I locked the back door, the garage door, I made sure all the windows were locked. That bad feeling almost never went away that entire night, and I was still freaked out after what happened. Everyone was asleep, well except maybe for my sister. I trusted that she was still awake. I went to her room, and she wasn't. When I knocked, I'd woke her up. She said groggily that I could come in, so I came in quietly and sat down. She went back to sleep and I prayed nothing bad would happen again. Of course, my sister is the only one in the house who keeps her blind up at night. God knows why. And of course, the screen of her window had fallen off, and she never bothered to put it back on. So it was just glass. From there, I could see the entirety of the backyard, and if there was anything in my backyard, it could see me now too. I sat in her room for a good while. I want to say maybe 15 minutes had passed when abruptly, out of nowhere, I heard faint whistling. Very faint. But however close it was didn't matter, because it was coming straight from my backyard. It got closer. That whistling began to sound like a flute. I couldn't believe it. Didn't want to believe it. Another quick note. After reading some other person's story, it is believed that I could have heard a flute of a Navajo or Navajo witch. Anyway, 
now in the comfort of my own home came this strange music. Once I identified, it sounded like flute music. It went away. I quickly got up, told my sister goodnight, and didn't say a word after that, leaving her room. Still creeped out, with everyone else asleep and being alone, I turned on a lot of lights and I sat at the bar in the kitchen. At one point, I even thought to wake my dad up, just so I could be in the comfort of another person. I was only 17. I ended up not doing it, thinking my dad would be teed off. As I sat there, once again came the faint crunching of gravel rocks from my backyard. Whatever was there, I could hear it. It was no more than five feet away from the back door. Then came a small, short knock on the glass. I froze and waited. Every minute came one more singular knock. This just scared me even more. Skinwalker or not, something was on the other side of that door, and I wasn't going to stick around to find out. Luckily for me, my back door has a cover, which is also just glass. I flicked off the lights and walked towards my bedroom. I didn't bother looking at the back door. I stayed in my room for the rest of the night. I never left. I was up for a good three hours after everything occurred. Even then, I heard strange noises from outside my window too. I remained horrified until somehow and some way I fell asleep. The next morning, everything seemed fine. I truly don't know what happened that night, but I'm glad I went with my gut. I don't think I'd be here if I hadn't. The Echo From Reverberator I am 28 years old, living in Columbus, Ohio. I work in IT, and up until last year, I lived in a pretty standard apartment complex on the outskirts of the city. It's one of those places with a bunch of three-story buildings clustered around a central parking lot. Nothing fancy, but decent enough for a single guy in a budget. This all went down right before Halloween. The complex had started to put up some cheap decorations. I'd been living there for about two years by then, and nothing out of the ordinary had ever happened. The scariest thing I'd encountered was the occasional raccoon digging through the dumpsters. It was a Thursday night, and I was getting home late from work. We'd had a major system crash, and I'd spent hours trying to get everything back online. By the time I pulled into my complex, it was almost midnight. To my annoyance, the parking lot was unusually full. There must have been some sort of event going on that I had forgotten about. All the spots near my building were taken. I ended up having to park clear on the other side of the complex, a good five minute walk from my own apartment. Not a big deal, I guess, just inconvenient. I grabbed my laptop bag and I started trudging across the parking lot. The yellow streetlights cast long shadows across the asphalt. I was about halfway to my building when I heard it. A voice, it was soft but very apparent. It came from the shadows between two parked cars. Excuse me, can you help me? I'm lost. I stopped, peering into the darkness. The voice sounded like it belonged to an older woman. My first thought was that one of the resident's grandparents had gotten turned around in the complex. Uh, hello? I called out. Where are you? There was a shuffling sound. Then I saw a figure step out from between the cars. In the dim light, I could make out the shape of a small, hunched woman with wispy white hair. She was wearing what looked like a nightgown or robe. Oh, thank goodness, the woman said, her voice quivering. I was taking out my trash and I got all turned around. These buildings all look the same in the dark. Could you point me to Building C? I felt a pang of sympathy. Building C was clear on the other side of the complex, and this poor old lady had wandered pretty far. Of course, I said, taking a step closer. 
It's actually back the way I came. I can walk you there if you like. As I moved towards her, something made me hesitate. Maybe it was the way she stood, completely motionless, like some sort of cardboard cutout, or the fact I couldn't quite make out her face in the shadows. I felt a chill run down my body. Then I found myself taking a step backward. That's very kind, the woman said, but her voice had changed. It was deeper now, and there was reverb to it in a weird way. Made my skin crawl. Why don't you come a little closer? I'm having trouble seeing you. Despite every instinct in my body screaming at me to run, I stood there petrified. I watched the figure, which now seemed to shift. It was subtle at first, like a ripple passing through water. Then in the span of a single heartbeat, it grew. The hunched form straightened and expanded, the wispy hair disappeared, and the figure shot up to well over six feet tall. What stood before me now was a towering, vaguely humanoid shape. In the dim light, I could see that its skin, if you could call it that, was a patchwork of textures. In some places it looked like normal human skin, in others, it was more like rough tree bark or sleek animal fur. Its face was the worst part. A blank featureless expanse with just the suggestion of eyes and a mouth like an unfinished sculpture. I stumbled backward, my heart pounding so hard I thought it might burst from my chest. The thing took a step towards me, and when it spoke again, it was with a chorus of voices, men, women, children, all layered over each other, like a hell-bound choir. It made my head spin. Don't let go, I just want to talk. I just want to feel, I just want to feel. It said, reaching out with a hand that seemed to be constantly shifting and reforming. I turned and ran sprinting across the parking lot toward the nearest building. I heard it behind me, a sound like bare feet slapping against asphalt, but much too fast, too rhythmic to be human. I reached the building and yanked open the door, not even caring that it wasn't my own. I raced up the stairs to the second floor and pressed myself against the wall, trying to quiet and steady my breathing. For a long moment, there was silence. Then, from right outside the building, I heard a voice. My voice. Hello? Is anyone there? I think I'm lost. My blood ran cold. It was a perfect imitation of my voice, down to the slight nasally tone I get when I'm nervous. Can someone please help? I don't know where I am. I stayed there, pressed against the wall for God knows how long. The voice, my voice, called out a few more times before eventually falling silent. Soon I worked up the courage to peer out the window. The parking lot was empty, no sign of that strange figure or anyone else for that matter. I waited there until the sun began to come up, before making a mad dash for my apartment. I packed a bag, called in sick to work, and went to stay with a friend for a few days. When I came back, everything seemed normal. No one in the complex mentioned anything strange, and I tried to convince myself it was all some kind of stress-related thing. But I couldn't shake the memory of that voice, those voices or the sight of that shifting, impossible form. I broke my lease two months later and moved to a new place closer to downtown. I tell myself it's for the shorter commute, but we all know the real reason. I still live in Columbus. I avoid that part of town now. Sometimes when I'm driving home late at night and see someone walking alone in a parking lot, I feel a surge of irrational panic. And every now and then, when I'm drifting off to sleep, 
I can remember that voice, and I pray that I don't hear it again, calling. Hello? Is anyone there? I think I'm lost. Skinwalker in Southern Ontario From Blue Collar Farmer This story includes my personal account and also my friend's multiple encounters. Let's start with mine. I'm from rural Southern Ontario, Canada. I was 18 years old, in college, and I often got home late due to the professors having other jobs and teaching us on the side. In late November, I noticed whenever I would come home and go to unlock the house, the noises would stop. For context, I live on a main side road with bush dotted along the road. My house was situated across from a bush along two rows of trees to one side, and the back of the house being more bush. For about two months straight, I shrugged it off as the cold pushing all the animals south or them hibernating. That was until one night. I was taking out the garbage to the laneway late at night due to the garbage truck coming early in the morning. As I rolled the bins to the end of the laneway, I noticed a pair of eyes staring at me through the bushes. I instantly felt dread pour through my body, so I booked it back to the house. When I got back and looked behind me, there was nothing. Not a light in sight except for the house lights. I shrugged it off as the house lights reflecting off of something down there. Those were my first two signs that something was out there. About a month and a half later, I got out of my truck to go inside the house through the garage. As I was about to open the garage, I heard a blood-curdling scream from the middle of our field. It sounded maybe 400 feet away. It took me a second to unfreeze myself, and then I quickly opened the garage door and booked it inside. Since then, things have gone back to normal for me. I hear birds and owls at night and even coyotes. Until one week. It was spring, so there should have been birds out chirping, crickets being out and about. But I didn't hear a thing around. I remember thinking that thing was back, and a feeling of being watched accompanied me every time I was outside. That's all for me for now. Now onto my friend's story. This also takes place in Ontario. He's had three encounters with what I think was a skinwalker. I'll share the story from his perspective. I was on my way to my girlfriend's dad's cabin in Ontario, around Algonquin. We were about 20 minutes out from his place. The drive had been peaceful so far. The two of us were exhausted from the long drive we had. Out of nowhere, I saw this dog on the road. It was a kilometer away, but just sitting there, not moving. So I started to slow down. I flicked my high beams off and on, but nothing. It wouldn't budge. I slowed down even more, until I was about three meters away from it. Suddenly, my girlfriend spoke up. What the heck? Why is it just sitting there? I shrugged and continued to watch it closely. I then watched it get up. It began to walk around towards the passenger side of the car, and it didn't break eye contact with me. I kept staring at it until it was around the back of the car. I think that's the neighbor's dog, said my girlfriend. They have two dogs. Maybe one of them got out. Okay, I'm gonna walk to the house and see if they're home, to see if their dogs are there. Could you go grab it? She said. I nodded, and the two of us got out, going our separate ways. I could see the dog through the car's taillights and the house lights. As I started to walk towards it, it began to move away in a kind of sidewalk, all while keeping eye contact with me. Weird, I thought. How was it keeping pace with me like that? I decided to start jogging after it, and still somehow it kept pace with me. Then it started getting faster. It was strange. I was jogging pretty fast and it was just out walking me. 
It then began to bark in a weird way. Like every bark after the first was just a copy paste of the first one. Like a program or something, same pitch and everything. It then ran backward into the ditch and I followed it. By now I was around a kilometer away from the car, so I couldn't see anything. I could hear it barking out there, but it seemed far away. I went into a sprint and got to where it sounded like it was coming from, and nothing. I then heard more barking farther away somewhere else. That's not possible, I thought. I can't be running that fast. I then pulled out my phone and turned on the flashlight. As I did, I saw something run across the road into the opposite ditch. Then something even stranger happened. The dog stood up on its hind legs and ran into the trees on those legs. I froze then. When I broke out of my state of paralysis, I truly realized how far away I was from the car. I turned around and ran as quickly as I could back to my car. My blood was really pumping then. I felt as if I'd gone into fight or flight mode, like that thing could possibly be on my heels. I tried to run even faster. As I drew close to the car, I saw my girlfriend running towards it. Get in! She called. We have to leave! We both hopped into the car and gunned it down the road. I looked in the rearview mirror, and that dog was sitting in the road again, about five meters from where the car was. What happened? She said. I steadied my breathing, then told her what happened. She started to cry and told me something. I walked up to that house. No one was home, but the door was open and the screen door was shut. I peered inside. Both their dogs were asleep on the couch, just fine. I don't know what you were chasing, because it looked like you were chasing a replica of one of their dogs. I heard footsteps and saw you running, and I knew something was wrong. We were both shaken up and made it to the cabin, ready for a sleepless night. That was my friend's first experience. His second happened at the cabin he stayed at, about 20 minutes from where the first encounter was. Here's that story. My girlfriend and I were staying at our cabin in the woods one weekend. We had a good time and went to bed drunk. I woke up in the middle of the night with a dry throat, so I went off to get some water. As I was drinking it, I had an itch to smoke a cigarette. So I opened the screen door and walked outside along the wet grass. I pulled out my pack of cigarettes and lit one. It was a peaceful night, very quiet. I was half asleep still, so I didn't notice the lack of noise around. As I took a drag of the cigarette, I noticed a coyote walking up. This thing's got balls, I thought. As I kept smoking, the large coyote walked up about 10 meters from me, got up onto a picnic table, and sat there. As I looked at it, it seemed off. It had patches of fur missing, seemed a little too skinny, and it sat more like how a man would sit if he were pretending to be a dog. Its joints were just skin and bone. Somehow it didn't really click with me just how off this thing was, so I finished my cigarette. I flicked the butt towards the thing in front of me, and both me and this thing watched it fall to the ground. I stared at the cigarette for a second and looked up, Within that brief moment, the thing was gone, like it had never been there. Wow, I must be really drunk, I mumbled as I turned away and walked inside to bed. My friend's last encounter was again in the same place on yet another weekend. Here it is. In the fall of 2023, my girlfriend and I were again at her dad's cabin in southern Ontario. It was a weekend of just her and me drinking with ourselves and the cats. It was a good night. At around midnight, we were watching a movie, when I noticed something was weird. The insects outside that I could clearly hear a moment ago went silent. Not a sound. 
I didn't really focus on that fact and instead watched the movie. As the movie came to a close, I felt a feeling of dread. I looked over at the two cats that lived in that cabin. They were staring at the door that led outside, hair straight up, mewing weirdly. My girlfriend started to get scared, and I tried to reassure her. Then, we heard a thump upstairs. What the heck was that? My girlfriend whisper screamed. I don't know, but I'll go check it out, I said. I grabbed the machete that was beside the door and went upstairs with the wood creaking all around me. Just a possum or a raccoon, I thought, as I hit the top of the steps. As I walked through the upstairs, I noticed it was coming from the roof. I could hear something walking around on the roof up there, and it was big. I hustled back downstairs, but had to keep calm as I saw that my girlfriend was now crying. It's fine, it's nothing. Probably just a raccoon walking on the roof trying to get in. I made up a quick lie to calm her down. After that, I went around the house, shutting the windows and locking everything up. As we huddled in the blankets and talked about what was happening, we both heard this distorted scream from the trees. It sounded like a man or a woman screaming, but twisted in some way. It lasted for about 10 seconds before going quiet. After that, we stayed frozen to that spot till morning, not sleeping a wink. We packed everything up and left as soon as we could and made it back home safe. As dumb as I am, I'm probably gonna go back there with her, but this time I'll be armed in case something decides to fight. Thank you for tuning in to Unexplained Encounters. If you're not already, follow and listen to Unexplained Encounters on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or your favorite podcast app. Leave us a rating while you're at it. Get some cool creepy merch at eeriecast.store. Check out my other show where I narrate scary work stories. It's called Tales from the Break Room. For more terrifyingly entertaining shows from EerieCast, go to eeriecast.com. And if you want to listen to Unexplained Encounters and all the other EerieCast shows without pesky ads, sign up for EerieCast Plus at eeriecast.com plus. You'll also get exclusive access to horror audiobooks only available to EerieCast Plus members. And you'll get 20% off our EerieCast.store merch through our members-only monthly discount code. Finally, if you have a scary story of the unexplained, send it to me at darkstories.org. I think that's about it. Thank you so much for joining us. Stay safe out there and stay creepy. Because this world... It's a strange one.